The long jump is one of humanity's most elementary exhibitions. You take a running start, and then you jump as far as you can. It's also one of our oldest competitions. In 656 BC, an Olympian named Kionis of Sparta is thought to have jumped 7.05 meters, or 23 feet 1.5 inches. Whether this was a world record or for how long it stood isn't really known, but if that mark is to be believed, it's only modestly beaten in the 2500 years to follow. In 1901, Ireland's Peter O'Connor leaps 24 feet 11.5 inches. With the return of the Olympics as an international pursuit, the record is challenged by countless track and field athletes, and in 1935, Jesse Owens extends the all-time best jump to 26 feet 8 inches. This holds for 25 years, until fellow American Olympian and gold medalist Ralph Boston adds 3.5 inches in 1960. What follows is a back and forth between Boston and Russia's Igor Tarovanezian, but the scale of their ambitions is getting smaller and smaller. They're dealing in fractions of inches at this point. In 1965, Boston beats his own mark by a patch of sand they may as well count in individual brains. If you stand far back enough to observe the entire jump, you have to squint to see the progression of the world record over the last 30 years. And it's important to note that thanks to the rise of the modern Olympics and college sports, track and field has absolutely exploded in popularity during this time. Many of the world's best athletes have dedicated themselves to the long jump at one point or another. And yet, collectively, this is the best humanity can do. What is the maximum distance that our anatomy allows us, as human beings, to jump? In the 1960s, it appears as though we've answered that question. The boycott was among the most effective tools of the civil rights movement, utilized to challenge racist institutions and help accomplish hard-fought victories all across the United States. In 1968, more attention turned to athletic institutions, including the New York Athletic Club, which, while notorious for refusing membership to people of color and Jewish people, was more than happy to boost its ticket sales by inviting black athletes to compete in their events. One such event, on February 16th in the brand new Madison Square Garden, is picketed by hundreds of people protesting their membership practices. Most black athletes refuse to compete, but the University of Texas at El Paso track team shows up anyway. Their star long jump specialist, Bob Beeman, leaps 26 feet, 3 and a half inches. Nothing special by competitive standards, but more than enough to surpass his thinned out competition. Beeman and his teammates had discussed whether to join the boycott, but ultimately doubted its effectiveness. After all, UTEP's football players had organized a sit-in months prior, and it seemed to accomplish nothing. But more acutely, the 21-year-old Beeman is lonely in El Paso, and lacks the means to visit his hometown of New York on his own dime. The all-expenses-paid trip to compete in front of his friends and family is just too much for him to turn down. A week later in Oakland, Beeman jumps a much stronger 26 feet 11.5 inches. Someone, who is apparently angry about his appearance in New York, emerges from the stands and tells him, something could happen to you this weekend. Nothing comes of the threat, but Beeman is shaken up. Around this time, he takes to writing poetry, more for himself than for anyone else. Beeman is one of the most promising track and field athletes in America, and he's on track to compete in the Mexico City Olympics later in the year and he is in anguish over whether to throw it all away to protest the racism he experiences day in and day out. How must I be lonely, he writes. Why can't you love me and want me until the end of time? Beeman continues to jump, and in March he sets the indoor world record with a leap of 27 feet 2.75 inches. He's very quickly becoming the man to beat in Mexico City. For Bob Beeman and his teammates, things are immediately and completely different. Any prior conflict and indecision has now disappeared within a UTEP track team that is scheduled to compete at BYU, a school that teaches that black people are inferior as a matter of policy. In protest, Beeman and seven other members of the team refuse to make the trip. UTEP officials now have an opportunity to show solidarity with the athletes they're so proud of. Instead, they kick all protesting members off the team and revoke their scholarships, essentially kicking them out of school entirely. In a further act of reprisal, Beeman's wife is fired from her job. Five months removed from the Olympic Games, Bob Beeman's track and field career is evaporating. Lacking the resources to travel all over the country, Beeman stays in Texas, jumping in track meets as an independent. In San Antonio two weeks later, he posts a stunning win-assisted leap of 27 feet 4 inches. Wind assistance is an unfortunate but common disqualifier. Many outstanding jumps have been ineligible for the record books because the wind speed was greater than the maximum allowable 4.47 miles per hour. Beeman's jump was inflated by a wind speed of 8.9, but he impresses the crowd all the same. He joins the Houston Striders track team a few days later and keeps jumping and keeps impressing. 
In June, he finally jumps 27 feet, 4 inches, with no wind assistance. It's only 3 quarters of an inch from the all-time record. Beeman has two goals. The first is to make the U.S. Olympic team. The second, and far more outrageous goal, is to register a 28-foot jump. This would require him to shatter Ralph Boston's record by about 8 inches. In modern times, this record has never been broken by more than 6 inches. The record progression has been entirely stuck in the mud. It hasn't budged even a quarter inch in three years. But Boston, the veteran who's become Beeman's mentor, thinks he can do it. So does the great Jesse Owens, who suggests that the altitude will help him out. Mexico City, host of the 68 Olympics, sits nearly 7,400 feet above sea level, and high altitudes have proven to be slightly advantageous to long jumpers. After essentially punching his ticket to Mexico City with a 26-foot, 8.75-inch jump at the Olympic trials, the altitude theory is put to the test on September 14th. Beeman jumps at South Lake Tahoe, about 6,200 feet above sea level. On this day, he's further aided by a record-disqualifying wind speed of 7.1 miles per hour. Even with both these advantages, he can only jump 27 feet, 6.5 inches. An incredible leap, but still about 6 inches away from his goal. 28 feet just doesn't seem feasible. To compete for a medal, Beeman must first pass the qualifying round, in which he's allowed three attempts. On his first jump, he steps just over the line, and the try is disqualified. Disaster strikes when the second attempt is disqualified for the same reason. Especially tragic, because Beeman could easily qualify with even an average jump. One sports writer later suggests that just to play it safe, he should have jumped a foot before the line to easily clear the mark. He doesn't. Despite the circumstances, Bob Beeman goes for broke. And this time, he avoids the foul. 26 feet, 10 and a half inches, still more than a foot away from his goal of 28. But he's in. He takes a few heaving breaths and fades into a sprint. The wind is blowing within legal limits. This will be a record eligible jump. Later, Beeman will say of this leap, I felt alone. He hits the sand with such violence that his momentum carries him out of the pit. It's a great jump. Even though it's early in the round, he's clearly a frontrunner for the gold. But did he hit 28 feet? As the officials perform the measurement, Beeman plays a series of guessing games and ultimately concedes that no, he probably didn't. He feels like he came close and ultimately settles on 27 feet 10 inches as his best estimate. If true, this would not only virtually guarantee him a gold medal, it would shatter the world record by more than 5 inches. Given the tiny margins by which this record has been broken over the years, beating it by five and a quarter would be monumental, probably far enough to stand for years and years. The measurement is taking a while. Beeman watches as the judges take the unusual step of bringing out a tape measure. After 20 entire minutes, the distance is officially announced, 8.90 meters. Like most Americans, he doesn't quite understand how far that is. When someone tells him the distance in feet and inches, he is no closer to understanding. Beeman collapses to the ground. He'll be fine. He's experiencing what is later diagnosed as a cataplectic seizure in which one system is so overwhelmed with emotion that one's muscles temporarily stop acting correctly. He cannot physically process what has just happened. He has done something impossible. The contest is over, and everyone knows it. Fellow competitor Igor Tarovanesian, who once held the record himself, says, Compared to this jump, we are children. Days prior, fellow American medalists Tommy Smith and John Carlos had displayed Black Power salutes on the Olympic podium as protests against racism. 
IOC President Avery Brundage, who during the Berlin Olympics decades prior had no issue with the Nazi salute, was outraged. He successfully demanded for Smith and Carlos to be expelled from the Olympic Village, lest he ban the entire U.S. track team altogether. Bob Beeman and Ralph Boston didn't care. They made protests of their own on the podium, with Boston standing barefoot and Beeman rolling up his pants, revealing black socks to protest black poverty. I can find no evidence of Brundage seeking retribution against them or even commenting on the matter. Maybe he simply realized that he lost. Fifty years later, Beeman's jump remains the Olympic record. It stood as the overall world record for decades until it was just barely beaten by Mike Powell in 1991. For half a century, no other human being has been able to touch it. This jump remains one of the most astounding athletic achievements ever.